Dr. Richard Kiley currently serves as the Senior Fellow in the Office of Engagement Initiatives um, as a Senior Lecturer in the Department of City and Regional Planning. He was the inaugural director of Cornell Center for Community Engaged Learning and Research, now the Office of Engagement Initiatives, in support of Engaged Cornell, a large-scale campus community engagement initiative. In his current position, he is leading an effort to evaluate and conduct research on the impact of OEI programs and university-wide activities that support engaged Cornell. As a community-engaged scholar and practitioner, he is interested in learning about and contributing to the different ways people work together to have a positive impact on the world and the potential role of community-engaged learning and research in higher education and facilitating the process. He is an assistant professor. He was an assistant professor in the, in the Department of Lifelong Education Policy Administration at the University of Georgia where he taught courses in community development, qualitative and community-based research, global service learning, program planning, and learning theory. <clears throat> His research during that time focused on adult learners in higher education with a focus on community-based learning, the experience of immigrant communities and policies and practices that accommodate greater access to education. Um, he has won a great number of awards. <laughs> Um, Richard's research focus on student learning, faculty development, community partnerships, and institutional approaches in the field of community-engaged learning and research. He continues to write, consult, and conduct workshops in institutes in many different areas of community-based global learning, um, focusing on transformative approaches to, to program and curriculum development, critical reflection, which I'm really excited for us to talk about, intercultural learning, community development, and evaluation. He was the co-founder of a community-driven global service learning partnership in Nicaragua, which will be entering its 25th year in 2019. He continues to be a field builder in global service learning and is a, and is a co-founder um, of a really great uh, organization that's globalsl.org, a multi-institutional hub supporting ethical global learning community campus partnerships. Continues to be an active scholar in the area of service learning. He serves as a reviewer and editorial board member of lots of journals um, and a co-editor of the Michigan Journal of Community Service Learning um, on special sections. So for any information, um, I'm sure he would be happy to share that. Uh, but I just wanted to welcome you here today. One of my favorite exercises to do uh, in community engaged learning with anyone, student, staff, fac faculty, community members, myself, is an identity exercise. You know, you just um, unpack your identity. It actually helps with relationships, I find. So it's a good therapeutic exercise. <clears throat> and it's fascinating to me. I, I do it completely unstructured. I used to do it with like structural dimensions like race, class, gender, or cultural features. And I stopped like years ago, and I stopped doing that. And now I just ask people just unpack who you think you are, and it's a fascinating um, exercise, multi-layered, how people get meaning to who they are. And and then when we get to some of the structural issues and whether or not their identity is valued, that becomes very powerful as well. Uh, and what's our role in supporting each other so that our identities are valued? So it's an exercise that I've done over the years in a lot of different places. So whenever I hear that read, I'm always thinking. Yeah, but I'm a townie in Ithaca. I never had access to Cornell. Worked in a lot of really interesting city jobs. I worked in, um, in parks growing up. So um, I worked in the corporate world. I worked in a hotel in DC. I worked overseas in a lot of different countries. And I always think about that. And then I read, um, when I hear this, I'm always like, is that really who I am? But anyway, um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about community-based approaches to, um, to learning and research and the role of higher ed, and I've struggled with it for many years, whether or not higher ed is the place where you can have the most impact with communities or if there are other organizations. I've also worked in not-for-profits, so I feel like I've had a lot of experiences that informs this work, the, particularly working with different communities, so hopefully that'll come out um, today. And, you know, I'm excited about this book. It was, a, you know, we've been in this global SL network that was meant that Nicole mentioned. Um, not Nicole, Kristen, sorry, Nicole okay. just left. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we tried to put a lot of things that are on that website in here, um, and we hope that it's useful for practitioners. Um, and so that was really why we um, ended up with a long-term initiative. Um, actually, the book was supposed to come first, and then the institutes and the web-based hub and 
and so on. And um, so it's kind of interesting how life plays out. Um, before I start, I just wanted to go around the room because I really want to know who you are. Uh, so if you could just um, tell me what institution you might be representing, any questions that you have when you saw the title of this workshop, things that you're grappling with, I'd love to just hear that so I can tailor the workshop as well, make sure it, it actually hopefully meets some of your needs and concerns and interests. So maybe if we could start here. And then before I start, I just wanted to thank Kristen for putting together and changing the fonts. So apparently everything switched over from my Mac to this computer. So thank you and thanks for the introduction. And then I want to thank Megan and Lou Jean, who's not here, who has a little bit of a feeling a little sick right now. Some of you may know Lou Jean, but Lou Jean is my hero as well as Megan is, well now Kristen is. So um, Lou Jean has been, uh, and Megan have both have treated me with such kindness over the years. When I first met Lou Jean, um, prior to meeting Megan, I felt like she was a kindred spirit, even though she ages me by maybe just five years. Um, well, she's like 50 now, I think I'm 45. Um, so um, anyway, I just thank you, Lou Jean. I hope you're feeling okay right now. So maybe we'll start here and just, if you just share sort of um, who you are and what some of your interesting questions are. Um, my name is Holly Quixie, and I'm the Director of Educational Pipelines at SUNY Buffalo State. And um, my primary role is that of a dual enrollment program with high school students who um, come to Buffalo State to take college courses. And so the title intrigued me because part of my other job is part of the Westside Promise Neighborhood Program. And so with that, I lead an Emerging Leaders Program. And so I was coming to see well, what other um, strategies can I use to you further engage the West Side as we try to grow that West Side Promise program. Um, what, what page is that <clears throat> when you work for the West Side? Um, it's really uh, whoever applies, that's who I have. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm there to meet and greet and <laughs> whoever it is. But for the most part, it's been mostly adults, but I have had some senior citizens. Oh, I've okay. had some more younger people of various, you know, degrees and abilities. So at this point, I'm thinking about making the Emerging Leaders Program a two-tier type of thing where it will still be a very grassroot type of program and then maybe graduate to a certificate program for those who want to kind of progress and move on and kind of use it as a feeder to make the future leaders of uh, neighborhood I mean, um, organizations, the new executive directors, those types of things, or potentially those new social change agents. Yeah, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Remind me, if you haven't heard about it, there's a Natural, Natural Leaders Initiative in Ithaca, run by Margo Hittleman, who's a really friend of mine, and we went to grad school together, and it's produced uh, all sorts of leaders in our local community that have gone to different organizations or doing really amazing grassroots work. They're all kind of change agents. So uh, remind me to link okay. you up with her. Okay. It's a pretty Thank cool you. program. Good evening. Uh, my name is Megan Connolly. I'm the Associate Program Director here at Brook Hill in Buffalo. I know some people here from the um, Applied Learning Program that I run called the Higher Fellowships, which is an emerging and community economic development for Cornell undergraduates with Buffalo nonprofits. I think my interest in this is just thinking about how these partnerships can be drivers of equity, whether that's um, you know, policy making, the, the processes, the processes that communities are engaged in community and economic development work, and also in thinking about internships, co-ops, um, other applied learning opportunities, how that can be helpful in closing the equity gap for students that otherwise might not have access to those types of career pipelines. Hi, um, I'm Betsy Bowen. I'm a social work professor at UB. Um, I do a lot of community-based and community partnering in my research, which is mostly around housing and homelessness. Um, also, with some of our great PhD students in social work, we just started on a project that we learned about through the research community partner oh, matching thing. Oh, um, so I think we were hoping to learn some best practices mm -hmm. for that, and I'll let you guys say more about that. Are you the doctoral student that she mentioned? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> right here. Welcome. I'm Andrew. I'm a PhD social work student here because of this. Um, I'm Nicole. I'm, I'm, I'm in the MSW part. So I'm in my first year and uh, 
just moved here two months ago, and we are specifically working on a project with community, not community, um, I don't, I'm terrible with acronyms, Employment Opportunity. Oh, Center for Employment. Center for Employment Opportunity is what the C is. Uh, and it's hooks uh, formerly incarcerated people up with employment options. So, and I right now am work, working at a nonprofit called Peace Springs Western New York, which some of you have probably heard of. Um, and that also does education for uh, people who've been incarcerated. Great. Yeah, Cornell's got, have you heard of Cornell's mm -hmm. theft? Prison education program. No, they I offer haven't. associates degrees. Oh. It's taught by graduate students and faculty. Taught pro bono mm -hmm. uh, in Auburn. Well, in a couple of um, uh, prisons right now, but they also have a minor in crimes, prisons, and justice and education. Uh, but they also they partner with um, uh, Cuban Community College uh, to offer the associates degree. They'd like to offer a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the formerly incarcerated learners are um, at, at Cornell and other institutions now. It's a pretty cool program. Cool. I'll look it up. Yeah. Uh, hi, Renee Tenzo. <clears throat> I'm, I wear a lot of hats in this space, but um, the hats that I'll feature are, um, I'm with Duval College, and then I also am the board co-chair of the Community Health Worker Network. So what my interest is really to, to facilitate partnerships between community organizations and colleges that would um, you know, result in the development of training programs that are relevant and accessible community um, and also opportunities for students to engage more um, fully in the community, you know, resulting in kind of lifelong engagement and social justice mindset. Yeah. <laughs> mindset work. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard work. Yeah, so I, I'm a professor of philosophy at Duval College, which means mindset work. Is which college? I'm sorry. Duval. Okay. Um, so mindset work is my whole my whole shtick. Um, as far as some things that are sort of in the works, I know uh, some folks I'm working with in, in, in relationship to what was just said, uh, we're looking at a social justice minor ah. that we're sort of working on. Um, <coughs> beyond that, I'm sort of very interested, we're currently looking at how to put uh, our general education, and some part of that could be serv service-based or even community-based, so we have to sort of think about sort of ways to, I think, make this work for us and for everybody. Great, thank you for coming. I'm Amanda Winklesass. I'm from the UD Graduate School of Education. I am um, the new director of a program that has not yet launched of the, the UD Teacher Residency Program um, that's intended to work to, it, it's sort of complementary to your work, um, build uh, capacity for Buffalo Public Schools and teacher pipelines. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to be part of building a program that I think rather than universities driving teacher education where a residency program allows for, for the program, for, for schools and community needs to drive um, and, and better connect with the university resources. So. That's a crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's my struggle with the contradictory nature of higher ed. It's not actually built in that direction. So, mm -hmm. good luck. No, I mean, right. we're all like, <laughs> make it happen. We'll make it happen. I'm Lynn Mitten, I'm from Berlin. Uh, I'm uh, with Tufti College Community Academy Center. And we run an uh, education program uh, for both adult and, adult and youth in the uh, community. So, with the, uh, uh, the demand needs, uh, ESL and financial classes uh, needs in the, the providing ESL and financial classes we provide those classes and therefore youth we uh, provide a public means program and along with that uh, we uh, equip our plus three college students not uh, necessarily plus three college students we have a, a college students from the overall from the best as America also uh, trying to uh, do hand uh, Take hands on experience at the same time. Uh, some of your uh, life skills can be a number of involved in the uh, in classes. Great, thanks. Hi, I'm Ophelia Mori, and I'm a community outreach manager here at the University of Buffalo. Um, I'm also a trained community health worker. You guys have seen my training. <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, I'm working on a project to train high school students to be community health advocates. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking to partner with. Um, Addressing um, health literacy and informing them about reliable health information resources. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, my name is Jason Knight. I am a professor at Buffalo State. Um, I think I'm an urban geographer slash urban planner. Um, have we met before? I don't know. We may have. I think we might have, like um, maybe five, four or yeah, five years probably ago. Probably somewhere along the line. I've That's worn a ton of hats. I think we did what? Um, <laughs> I was, I like you, I worked in the corporate world as a planner. I worked in government here in Erie County. Both my degrees are from UB. I never, like, I'm an academic at Buff State. People are like, well, how did you end up here? And I, like, I didn't. This was my plan to go to school here, <laughs> live here forever, go to school here, and have a teacher. But I just, did, I did so much experience in the region that I have. Um, I sort of was a natural fit. So I, I sort of consider myself a pracademic. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I like that. I'm at this cool. point. Yeah, I'm that's why I that one. That's a good one. <laughs> I ripped it off from somebody at another conference. It's not, it's not right. Right. <laughs> um, But I, but I have. So I, I was rushing here to put my pers I was put, put my personnel statements together, together for tenure. Uh, so I'm at that point like I I'm sick of writing journal articles that no one reads. So yeah. and I do a lot of work around m most of my work is on you know co-authored books on vacancy and abandonment and how we get to these issues in, in our cities and, and and then sort of examining some of the policies we've used and they're I think they're good work but they're not no one cares like they're into some obscure journal article you have to have the community you have to have a, from a library to get access to it. And so I'm at the point where I, like, I have to do something practical and, and, and applied in, in the community rather than just sitting back and waiting for stuff. And I do work, I you know, work with Habitat and still do stuff with our, our land bank, which I was a sort of founding member of that. But um, I, I just do not find the research component of academics to be um, where my mind is spent. Okay. And I think I'm at the right school. I, 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 I wanted to be at Buff State because of that, because mm -hmm. of the applied nature of it and the value I think that sees in that. And as a lifelong Western New Yorker, I just can't quit. You know, if I get this tenure thing squared away, then it's time to, <laughs> time to move on. But I've done some community work with some organizations, and some of the things that Kristen sort of outlined are absolutely true. Our our tenure process doesn't align with, mm -hmm. our timelines don't align with anybody's timeline, right? Yeah. And we've become so hyper-focused yeah. that we have this really good skill set, yeah. and we don't get to use it. Um, so I, I just, so from my perspective here is kind of like, get my feet in the door and kind of see what's out there. And I'm a one-man planning I think we did meet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like an associate, I'm like an assistant chair without the title or the pay. You know, I'm, I'm running a one-man show and, and you know, I've, it's been my life for five years and, and I'm pushing stuff off my plate a little bit. And trying to get it, so. Well, Jason, we need to talk. <laughs> yeah, but see, this is the thing, that the, this is the silo problem, right? Yeah. She's a buff stater, I've never met her. I've been here I, 18 years. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a silo problem because I've had my head down in my windowless office for five years. And that's the reality of no tenure process. But I think I can help you with this purpose thing. <laughs> it's a get in where you fit in kind of situation because a lot of times people will ask and you know and I teach a applied planning course every spring and I go to a community organization and I say what do you want and they want to they want yeah. they got a list that's a long mile list. long and I have students that have skill sets that are that big mm -hmm. and so it's kind of get in where you fit in. Yep. So that's kind of how I kind of approach. But them. I think I can help you with that. Okay. <laughs> I think so we've got some right. connections already. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and then we get to the break. <laughs> <laughs> we'll break. No, no <laughs> Thanks for sharing. I'm Brianna Gatman. I work at UB at the Clinical and Translational Science Institute. And um, I work in recruitment, so helping researchers get more people in their studies through a bunch of different methods. So. Um, ladies here are from community engagement team and I work a lot with them so I'm just here to learn more and um, yeah my background is working with the community and not not so much in academia um, and it's in working in university community partnerships so I'm just excited to get more perspective on that and how I could do more of that now. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Megan I'm Brianna said with the UB. Um, I'm part of the community engagement team. I'm a community research facilitator, which after three years, I'm still trying to figure out what that means or describe what that means to the researchers I work with. Um, so essentially what I do is I try to facilitate partnerships between the researchers that come to me, you know, one grant, one week before the grants do, or when they've already come up with the idea and say, oh, I want community now. So I'm kind of that, <laughs> person who has to try and help um, facilitate that um, partnership. I help run our community advisory board. Um, Renee is 
also involved in uh, the CTSI as well, with her many hats she was talking about. Um, I help recruit community reviewers for our IRB. We work with a local group called the Patient Voices Networks, who they've been research partners here at UB now um, for almost 10 years. And they actually started as participants in a research grant, and they've kind of formed into their own research group now. Um, so just kind of having my hands in a lot of different things. And I think I'm really here because I'm kind of at that point where our group is a little bit, we're new, but we're not. We've been around for almost three years. And I just still feel like we can do a better job as a university in terms of like, I feel like we always like to think that we come up with the best ideas and they're all the new ideas, but chances are those ideas already exist in the community. So how do we better leverage and support what the community has than trying to recreate the wheel where we just kind of step on each other's toes? So um, I'm, that's kind of where I'm coming from from this is really talking about balancing that power and, and resources because I think we're all tired and spent and how do we work smarter versus harder. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Terry Ann Smith. I'm also with the CTSI, but I'm a new member of their special populations team. So special populations um, includes low-income, minority, aged um, people, and we're trying to recruit them to um, clinical trials. But my background is I moved to Buffalo from New York City's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and I think Buffalo is a really interesting <laughs> and um, just through the, the personal experience, I'm interested in this whole university community partnership because I think there's a huge disconnect. Um, and, yeah. Wonderful. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, I'm Cal, okay. You're Cal, Cal's grad. Yeah. Agricultural life sciences, molecular biology, though. Yikes. Oh, yeah. Right, look at her. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know why she hangs out with us. We, she is way too cool for us. We don't know why she hangs out with us. We're like Terry Ann. We're like the we're, we're, unpopular we're lunch table. We're all twins. We're all twins. We're all twins. Not, Not each other. Each other. That was, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> we're the creepy side of the room. Um, I'm Danielle. And coming up, so. I'm Danielle, and I'm the community recruitment liaison at the CTSI at UB. Um, so I work with uh, Megan on the community engagement team, but we span across the special populations. I work really closely with Brianna for recruitment, kind of utilizing those community engaged strategies for for the recruitment that we um, are discussing with researchers and really kind of how they can think about different ways to go about engaging the community and how I can assist them with that um, kind of more boots on the ground. And for, for this topic, I think it's really interesting and, and Megan was talking about it too, we do so much programming as a community engagement team to really so there's people in the community who call the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus the wall, and like we're really trying to break down that line, break down the wall, and invite people onto campus to, you know, like to really form more of these partnerships. So um, that's where I'm coming from. Wow. <laughs> we get to mend all the bridges everyone else broke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a tough job. Yeah, like to kind of be the face that someone sees out at events and stuff like that, and when they're angry. So oh. we're like, we're here because we want to make a difference and listen to you. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I don't have any more for my bio, but I do have a couple of logistical things that I forgot uh, to mention earlier, if that's okay. Bathroom, um, exits. And all exactly. <laughs> um, so A, I'm really glad you guys are able to meet each other because I think that was one of the things that um, we know happens, uh, happenstance, but we really appreciate you giving them time to do it intentionally. So we really encourage that. Bathrooms out here, um, you make a right, and then they're gonna be on the right halfway down the hall. Feel encouraged to grab more food outside and drinks right here. Um, let me know if you need anything. We do have uh, some of the books that he references, and I will say, like, they have really cool tables, which I like. Um, yeah, because I like love a, reading, so but many, I love tables more. There's so many <laughs> tools in there, and one of our big issues was it's the theory and practice. Exactly. And so everything that we talk about, particularly Jess in our book, we're very different people with different backgrounds. Um, <laughs> social work, English, political science, international relations, and lots of other things. And uh, so we just made sure that anytime we talk about a theory, it's like, hey, what's the practical application of this? What is a really cool exercise? And because we've done many, many, many summits and institutes with faculty, staff, and community members, it's you know tried and true kind of methods. So hopefully they're really helpful. Um, I find that helpful whenever I'm you know, trying to um, 
do my community-based work is to have some exercises that I can do that are that are useful. Anyway, but there's a lot of frameworks in there, but then also, you know, sort of what's the application? Don't want to waste anybody's time. <laughs> Crazy idea that criteria for use, right? Yeah. You know, quality Thank criteria. You. Knowledge should be useful. It's, uh, but it's not typically uh, taken for granted. Easily digestible. So Good. I would highly encourage it. Um, and if you want to talk about it, we can chat afterwards. Which, um, when we talk about chatting afterwards, um, he said, I mean, a couple weeks ago, he would be available to grab coffee afterwards if yeah, you would sure. like to do that. So um, if yeah, you're people interested. People aren't tired, or you got to, I'm sure you have families to go home to, exactly. but I am here. So I always say to Megan and Jean, <clears throat> You know, if it's useful, useful is a big thing for me. Then uh, I'd love to. I'd love to engage in the conversations because you know this board does not have a formula. I'm still learning and been doing this for about, at least uh, from a higher ed perspective, 25 years. So uh, I'm still learning a heck of a lot. So. so I have a, Did you have I, any other logistics? Nope, that's it. Okay. You know, I have a question for me because you're you're saying you're doing it from a higher ed perspective, um, and I find that interesting. So, like my senior year. In Ithaca, uh, Jeff Lehman came to the university. He's a lawyer who defended the affirmative action case, and he gave a special course that year, race in America and at Cornell. And I thought it was really interesting because we looked at the theory. Yeah. And then I went to New York City and saw, well, um, I didn't grow up in America. I grew up in Jamaica, so. Um, you know, it goes my first introduction to America, and I just realized, okay, I'm really in a bubble here. Um, so you take that course, and then you go out. And I know one of the things Cornell's good at is recruiting people from all these different backgrounds from the country. Yeah. But I'm realizing now, like living in Buffalo, college is basically one of the first places that people meet individuals who are not like them. Yeah. So for me, 25 years in higher education, um, how can we fix that problem? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I think I'm gonna get at that a little bit in the presentation, but if I don't, we can come back to it if that's okay. Yeah. Because um, that is a really important question, and you're right, that's the most, in some ways, for some people, it's the most diverse population that they've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Hence, when I do that identity exercise, it blows people away, and it literally shifts mindsets. And it's based on transformational learning theory. And actually, I use a particular theory that underpins um, two different paradigms of learning, constructivist and critical. And I draw from a particular theory, and I've been using it for years, and it's really helped me um, think about how people think about themselves, they think about others, and their connections to others, how they think about the world, their assumptions. And I started off by, I won't go into it too far, because I could talk about it forever, but I use a sort of dissonance as a way, you know, oftentimes when people go outside the country, they get outside their fishbowl, it causes a little dissonance and they start to rethink their assumptions about their life, their experience, maybe come from Jamaica and then you go to Ithaca or you go to Buffalo, you go to New York City and it kind of triggers like, huh, the previous place I was at, I had a set of assumptions and I had an identity and it functioned in a particular way and now I've shifted my context and I see it very differently. So, uh, but I realize you can actually create dissonance in a classroom. And there's all sorts of ways to do that, and I've had a lot of practice in a lot of different contexts all over the world, creating dissonance. And so one of the things that I'll do is, um, before I start that exercise, I'll, I'll look at somebody and I'll say, tell me a little bit about your consciousness. And of course, I'll get the deer in the headlights look. I only had one person ever answer that question. I've done this <laughs> hundreds of times. And he's from California, and he's a surfer dude. He's like, dude, let me tell you about my consciousness. <laughs> and I, I was like, this is hilarious. I have to write this down. Can you say that again? But um, but it also just triggers in people, like, I've never thought about my consciousness. And then I'll say, but you're conscious, right? And then some people, if they're tired and they've come here, it's maybe not as conscious as they'd like to be. But it's the idea that we have a lot of taken for granted assumptions, and we often haven't reflected on those. And they may actually be harmful to ourselves and others. And so ultimately, we'll get there. But part of it's just unpacking those assumptions and learning how to surface assumptions. And it can be very dissonant, especially if you go to another country and you have a particular perception of a thing or yourself and it's very different from, and from the perspective of somebody else, and it triggers sort of a, a dissonance. And it may even be outside somebody's worldview. You may see something that's completely outside your frame of reference. You've never actually experienced before, um, like giving birth. That can be incredibly dissonant, and it can shift your identity ridiculously. So it doesn't have to be a negative thing. It can be a, a positive thing as well. So anyway, I'll just stop there. But if you're interested in that, 
coffee later on. <laughs> so it's a whole learning process that we engage in, and for students, it's pretty powerful. I've had freshmen that say to me, thank God you got to be triggered by a set of assumptions about what higher ed is. I'll also ask people about knowledge and quality criteria for knowledge, and nobody ever asked them that question, and whether or not they have control over how knowledge is generated and applied. And so we, we get to that one, too. I'll also ask students, I'll say, kids are mostly the students, but it doesn't matter what age, I'll say, how many students walk into the classroom um, looking to support the person next to them? How many people say that they do that? Never had anybody raise their hand. But if we're gonna build community together, what does that entail? So why don't we start right here? And if you're doing the identity exercise and you're finding connections with people and you had no idea that someone defines themselves that way because they're unpacking their assumptions for the first time, it's amazing what happens just in that hour in fact, they know the person next to them better than they know their significant other, probably their brother or their sister, because they've never actually unpacked their assumptions around who they are. So the, even just the construction part from a constructivist, uh, how we attach meaning to who we are is really interesting. But then when we think about how context um, looks at and how other people look at our identity, that's very different. And it could be you feel oppressed. And so we'll get there too when we talk about what it means to build community and, and have social responsibility, but we can do that in the classroom. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. A lot of that's in the book actually, um, when we do our institutes and everything. Uh, and then I wanna do some uh, exercises to kind of lift us up a little bit so that we don't fall asleep and, um, and if it gets kind of boring, um, just raise your hand and say, you know, reel it in. I might digress a little bit, which I just did a second ago, but that's kind of the way it is. Um, but hopefully it's useful. Um, and when someone mentioned walls, who mentioned walls? So I have a friend at Cornell who studies walls, and she goes to Israel, and she works with Palestinians and Israelis. She goes all over the world, actually, and studies walls, um, the border in the US and Mexico. Uh, she's a fascinating individual. She's in science and technology studies, and we're kind of kindred spirits, and we go have green tea, and we talk about walls and breaking down walls. And my doctorate at Cornell, my, the whole theme of it was building bridges. I just wrote about building bridges because I was so sick and tired of um, conflict and, and um, war and people, you know, and violence. And so I thought, well, I wonder if anybody will accept me, you know, just as a peace builder, as a bridge builder. That's all I do, actually. I mean, yeah, I've studied a lot. I've gotten lots of different degrees, but really my main goal is to build bridges with people. So when I see connections, I'm like, drop the mic, I'm done. I'm happy because I know that will lead to something probably more useful and maybe even my talk, right? Because you might get together and start doing some really cool things together. So um, that's important to me, and that will come out in the presentation. So just wanted to mention that. And then the other thing about being a townie in Ithaca, all I did growing up was break into Cornell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Even if I had a ticket to a sporting event, we sold it and broke in, me and my friends. Because we didn't go to Cornell. Our parents weren't from Cornell. And uh, it was like a goal, like, mm -hmm. and so it cracks me up when I'm at Cornell now. I still kind of check and see, like, do I, have an ID? do I need my ID? I used to sneak into the um, computer room. Because remember the days when they check your ID? Mm -hmm. They don't think they do that anymore at Cornell, but they used to. And it was really uncomfortable, and I'd have to figure out a way to sneak in to, like, print my resume or whatever. And I didn't have a computer. So I just have all these, like, it cracks me up when I'm there because I think about all the mischievous things that we did as kids just to kind of stick it to Cornell. But I have to admit, I do like Cornell, <laughs> and, and I didn't, you know, I didn't have a very holistic perspective of what Cornell was. But it does show me and remind me. I went to all the schools, and I never had anybody from. I never had any connection to Cornell. So I run a few programs with our local schools, um, and it's really important to me that people that don't have access, you know, actually get an opportunity to talk to Cornell students to be mentored. And um, some of the programs that I ran there, I weren't in the bio were uh, mentoring initiatives. Um, that work at university and community with. So I don't just work with adults. I've also worked with high schools and middle school students. So, I don't know if that's not working. It might okay. be the no, this is the thing. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's the book. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if you're interested in it, you can get 20% off. I have some actually. Oh, you do? Yeah. The books are these things. And we got them at 20% off. Oh, good. So. And if you want 40% off, just email me. <laughs> uh, be happy to help out. So these are just some of the questions. And when I say framing questions, it's for you as well, um, if they make sense. But you know, uh, when I, we say global, we don't mean international. We actually challenge the notion of international. 
And so we, a long time ago, people were using the term international service learning, that really bothered us. And so global now, at least in the field of global learning, a lot of offices are shifting their language toward global because we're so much more technology and interdependent. We're seeing ourselves as connected more deeply. And so part of our goal in the book is also to help people realize that what we're doing locally usually is connected to something in another country. Similar issues or actually just um, part of the relationship, historical relationship we've had with different places that we might not even think about. Um, so even just, usually if I do an identity exercise, very few people, if any, I don't think anybody has ever put down consumer. That's probably the largest part of our identity and the one that we hold most in common with almost everyone in the world consumption and so it's just fascinating because consumption is so important and it's so global but it's local it's regional it's national it's across state borders it's across our borders and so it means you have to engage in a historical kind of way of thinking it could be you could go all the way back to Aristotle or whoever you want to go back to um, to kind of understand our connections as humans um, but anyway I just want to make sure that you realize that because someone sent me an email today and said something like oh, they don't do international work, so I'm not sure if CBGL is gonna be, community-based global learning will be relevant. And I was like, ah, that global, still people think that that's international. <laughs> and it's very different, especially since I did one of my degrees in international relations, and that's a very different <laughs> way of thinking about the world, um, especially nowadays. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what we kind of consider, uh, the four authors there have taught courses all over the world in different cities in the US that are community-based. Um, that they've also been um, uh, um, executive directors of not-for-profits. So um, the, the knowledge and experience that comes into this book is just pretty extensive and from a lot of different institutional, organizational contexts. So we stepped back and we were like, if we had to generalize across any kind of situation that's community-based from a higher ed perspective, what would be those key components that would have to be in any course that isn't technical from a discipline? right? Because we're all trained in that way where we're isolated, as you say, in our discipline and we publish in these journals. We were thinking more about like, what if we thought cultural humility was important? Who teaches that? You know, that's an important one. What civic engagement? Is there a department of civic engagement? Is that something that maybe, well, what about critical reflection? A department of critical reflection. So we think all of those, the knowledge and skills in those areas are really important and can be taught in any discipline. So that's really important to recognize when I say key dimensions. Um, and think about yourself, if you had that, if you were thinking, what does global learning look like and, and what would be part of that? What would be the knowledge and skills and attitudes and behaviors of someone who is glo a global learner, a global citizen, or a community engaged, however you wanna frame it? Um, would there be some key components that almost everyone should think about? Uh, and then we have a particular definition that's based on a lot of other definitions that I think you'll find interesting. It's definitely not memorable in the way that you won't remember it. It's not pithy, it's not a sentence long, it's unfortunate that it's, it's very um, messy, but I think the world's kind of messy and we think the world's a little messy, so you might get a kick out of it. Um, then I wanna do a snowball exercise that's um, both uh, fun and energizing, but also just dis dis distressing because of the question I'll ask you in the snowball exercise. And you know, we're in Buffalo, snowballs get rain, <laughs> right? I know, Buffalo isn't just about snow. Blue jean showed me the flowers in May, so. Uh, and then, um, you know, what to, the book doesn't just focus on partnerships, but there is a section on uh, community, what we call community-driven partnerships. Sort of gets at your point, community-driven, what would that look like if it wasn't subject-centric? Um, and then what strategies foster uh, quality partnerships? I've got, we have a framework that we came up with called Fair Trade Learning. It kind of shifts the way in which we think about learning, and it's purposely called Fair Trade because people will think about Fair Trade, we know what Fair Trade is. <laughs> so what if learning was Fair Trade? What would that look like? Could you certify it? Um, anyway, would that mean that the community-driven piece, the certification that we're actually engaging with community before we think about learning or when we engage in learning? And then, you know, hopefully we'll have a nice discussion. And um, I think we have till 7.15. So let's see if we can get through this. Whoa, um, I'm going the wrong way. Ah, there we are. So these were the dimensions. I'm not gonna go into all of them. You have to buy the book. Sorry, uh, but hopefully they'll pique your interest. Um, development of cultural humility, seeking global citizenship. We actually call, we have a bunch of chapters if you're interested, not in the book, but in other places. Eric, my, my buddy, Eric Hartman, I met him when he was a doctoral student and he did his doctorate on uh, global citizenship. So he looked at like all these different 
philosophical approaches to global citizenship and did a really cool mixed method study. So uh, we've written a lot around that. Some of that's in the chapter if people are interested in what it would mean. I want you to think about what happens when you modify terms with critical. Does it mean you look like the critical thinker? Is that what it is or is there some tradition that's invoked, theoretical tradition that's invoked when we say critical? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. It drives me crazy, it's taken for granted. What does it mean to be critical? Um, is it like, get angry at somebody? That's not how we frame it. And then we talk a little bit about critically reflective practice and we actually talk in the book about the difference between reflection and critical reflection, what shifts what traditions are invoked, what concepts, what ideas, what assumptions are surfaced if you do critical reflection. And I mentioned it a little bit earlier when I mentioned the difference between constructivism, which is constructing meaning around your experience, and then understanding how institution, the socialization processes impact how we think about the meaning of our experience, right? Um, and, in, 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 and in particular, how the way we think and act oppresses others, ourselves and others, and that's really important. A constructivist theory wouldn't necessarily impose that kind of a framework. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and that's where we get to inter interrogating uh, power and privilege, and we talk a little bit about positionality as well. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, higher ed, learning and assessment, it's getting more and more important, and then health and safety, and we feel like um, from a higher ed perspective, it's, you, should, you should have a health, healthy, safe environment where we're putting students in community settings. Um, and then um, this idea of community-driven um, and we use the term, we stopped using the term service and that was purposeful because again, a lot of assumptions, there's a lot of assumptions around noblesse oblige and especially from higher ed, um, that it's a one way process, it's not reciprocal. And so um, we just decided, let's just not even go there and we'll use a different term. Hence we uh, came up, we had, do, had a lot of conversations about that because <coughs> as Jason pointed out, a lot of our writing is in a particular set of fields. Um, the nexus of international education, uh, civic engagement, um, intercultural communication, and, um, and a lot of other fields. And so um, we wanted to make sure that we were uh, not just um, speaking to a particular audience. Uh, okay, so um, I keep going the wrong direction. All right, here's the definition. And I want you to just take a second. Usually what I do is I juxtapose it with other definitions that were popular in the field of community-based learning. Uh, so, um, and often if I put up, I didn't want to put up the other two definitions that are very popular, but they usually start off with credit bearing or course based. Mm -hmm. um, again, we wanted to get away from the higher ed centric way of defining this work. So, uh, but I shouldn't have said that. I just want to see kind of what, what you think when you see this. So CBGL is a community driven learning and or service experience that employs structured, critically reflective practice to better understand global citizenship, positionality, power. I don't even know why the bolds came out. I, didn't, I don't even know if that was made for the transition. Structure and social responsibility in global context. It is a learning methodology and a community-driven development philosophy uh, that cultivates a critically, re critically reflective disposition among all participants. Um, and again, we were kind of responding to years and years, maybe 40 years of community-based work that was often framed as attaching a course to a service experience. Um, so just any kind of thoughts, anything that stands out there other than the fact that it's hard to remember? <laughs> yes? Well, to me, it, it actually resonates with an approach we use when we transition to tough workers, and that's the popular education approach influenced at Palos Verdes, right? So everybody's teaching and everybody's learning, and it's, a, and it's a, an immersion, and it's uncomfortable, and it's, you know, it involves a lot of critical reflection. How many other people are familiar with popular ed, popular education, or Palo Verde? Oh, wow, okay, cool. How about Miles Horton? Okay, the Highlander Center, Appalachia, Tennessee. So um, how about John Gaventa? Came after Miles Horton. I invited John Gaventa to the first event for Engage Cornell. I, there were a few people that knew John Gaventa, but just an amazing person, a development uh, veteran, community development veteran. But um, I highly recommend if you're ever in Tennessee to go to the Highlander Center. Trained a lot of amazing change agents, including Rosa Parks and a variety of others. They use rocking chairs. So we used to use my first courses in Nicaragua in the early 90s. So we'd sit in rocking chairs in the North Atlantic coast of Nicaragua on the Mosquito Coast. Um, very different place that was colonized differently than the Pacific Coast. And we'd sit around and do talking circles similar to popular education approach. Uh, but adult learning theory and popular education drives a lot of what's in this book as well. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I bet you see that in there, it's interesting. <laughs> 
about uh, anything else? What else are people thinking? And it could be just confusion or questions or anything that's noticeable. See, that surface experience is still in there. Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't totally <laughs> disinvest the service piece because we still have that audience in mind. Mm -hmm. And service learning is just, there's, you know, decades and decades of writing around service learning. So we wanted to be inclusive. You want to say something, Jason? No? no. Okay. Anybody else, Megan? I think it's interesting that it's, it, it, just reading it, there's no university, college, student. It's just completely removed from academia yep. and how it's framed. Yeah. We don't assume what that community is. So it's sort of like presumptuous to say for us community. And you know, community is defined and we work together, but we have a particular set of theories about how you build community. Again, it's that idea of, people think about community how do they frame that and so we didn't want to necessarily put a, a narrow narrowly defined community and there were set of stakeholders part of what we talk about in the book is stakeholder mapping and power mapping um, there's some program planning theories that come from adult head in there uh, some of my experience at Cornell my advisors taught program planning from adult head perspective anybody heard of program planning as like a, a thing a discipline maybe on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, fasc it's fascinating work, but it's Ron Cervero and Butch Wilson or Arthur Wilson, mm -hmm. and they studied for three decades. Uh, they challenged the notion that planning programs is about facilitating, mm -hmm. and they actually argue that educators are power brokers. And so they took three decades to study what relations of power are, just like John Gaventer or Paulo Freire or others or feminist theorists. Uh, and so, um, so anyway, when I we say power, we have a, uh, a pretty significant. Um, narrow or not narrow intentional framing of how we think about power and relations of power and how you might renegotiate oppressive relations of power. Uh, so I was fortunate uh, to study with, uh, Ron Cerro was my, my chair in, in the University of Georgia and Butch Wilson or Arthur Wilson, people call him Butch, he was my uh, chair of my doctoral committee. And uh, when I first met him and he named educators as power brokers, I was like, this guy's interesting. <laughs> so, um, and I used to teach a class in program planning um, and we go through this whole process of stakeholder mapping and identifying relations of power among stakeholders. But the goal of the course community base was to shift relations of power. So imagine working with students and community members and one of the goals is to shift relations of power. Is that possible in a semester? But we were very intentional about it. We used their methodology. They were interested in the practical application of shifting or working with relations of power. So if anybody's interested in that, I'd be happy to share a lot of resources around that. Um, it's, it's very interesting. I had a sort of an epiphany teaching the course because it was taught as a simulation, and then I changed it and made it community-based, so you're actually engaging with relations of power, real people, and it, it totally changed how I thought about the concepts and the practices within their theory. Because uh, in a simulation, it's a lot safer, and the po politics of planning aren't as, um, as real. And so when I was watching how students were grappling with mostly immigrant communities and organizations serving them, and particularly undocumented immigrants, this is in 2002 to 2006 in the South, um, it was, it was uh, the, the theories were working. They were explanatory. So it was really interesting. Um, okay, so that's that. Yeah, it was the right way. Okay, I just wanna show you this. Normally when I do a presentation, this is a framework that I draw from whenever I work with higher ed. And around 15 years of doing community-based work in a lot of communities, Georgia, New Orleans, Nicaragua, uh, Ithaca, so lots of places, um, I stepped back and I was like, if I were gonna train somebody to do this, particularly a faculty member, because I was struggling with my role as a faculty member, what would my doctorate be in, right? Because I started doing this work in 94 as a course, as a political scientist, working with a nursing professor and it was really a practicum or a clinical experience in, in the Mosquito Coast. And our students were doing health clinics and working at the hospital and doing health education workshops. And, uh, and then I went back to the institution and I was like, huh, I don't think our semester long course is gonna solve poverty in Nicaragua. And I actually don't think that the community college that I'm teaching at, Tompkins Cortland Community College, really has the resources to support this effort other than letting us teach the course. So what is the role of an institution how is an institution structured? What is fundamental about an institution? How do we think about knowledge? 
And how come the local knowledge that I'm working with in Nicaragua doesn't inform what we're doing in our curriculum? And are we even allowed to change our curriculum so that it satisfies what we're doing in Nicaragua or work with community partners? We did all sorts of radical things during those first, I mean, now it's in its 25th year of just mostly building relationships. But I started asking questions of what's the role of the institution? Not just the institution where I'm hired and I have my salary, but other higher education institutions or organizations that I'm working with. So I was really interested in change, organizational change in behavior. Do organizations learn? Can they change? Are there sets and norms of structures that we can shift in an organization to do this work better? So when I started this program, I actually got accepted to do this bridge building doctorate. And I just studied all the questions that I had. So that was one question I had is, what is the role of institutions in community-based work and creating partnerships? Uh, and then the other one was this idea of, some people call it research, I like to call it knowledge generation and application. I wanted to know about different paradigms of knowledge. I wanted to think more deeply about knowledge and the criteria we use for quality knowledge, whether it's generating knowledge or applying knowledge, right? Yeah. But think, do you think students actually go to, to the universe? So I think a part of this is discussing the relationship that students have with university. So I think students think of universities as a transactional place. They go there to get a degree, to get a job, to be in the economy. We as academics or think, we're trying to do something different to them than they come there, challenge their perceptions of, the, of themselves. All right, but how successful are we, do we think we're being with helping them change the whole socialization or their whole processing of why they even go to a university in the first place. You're told from you young that if you want to have a good life or stuff, you go to university. Yeah. Well, I would also challenge yeah. the notion of all of the roles in the university, yeah. not just students, not just mm -hmm. academics. What I'm saying is the whole way we think about knowledge generation isn't necessarily about generalizability, replicability, reliability, or causality. And if, if you ask somebody, yourselves, where did those criteria come from? Again, taken for granted assumptions. Very few people know where those criteria came from. So then what I ask faculty, not just students, what criteria do you use? If you had to own a set of criteria about quality knowledge, particularly if you were working with community members in the research design, would it mean you'd have to shift through the criteria that you use for quality knowledge? So that's the question I was asking. It wasn't about telling somebody how they should act or shifting how students should think. I just want them to surface their assumptions. I don't want them going through and spending a lot of money on university, as well as faculty who are doing community-based work, without rethinking how they think about knowledge. So that's the big thing for me. And understand the assumptions that we have about knowledge, and there are at least for me five paradigms of knowledge making. And I, and I share that with people. And I ask them to think about how the criteria shift depending on what paradigm you're in. Same could be said for learning. I do the same thing with that. So again, I had this opportunity to kind of unpack all these things and then share it, particularly with this notion of doing community-based work and challenging the institutional structure that supports those norms and expectations, like you were saying, that tenure package. Um, then the other piece that I was thinking about is like, wow, the pedagogy is so different when you take students outside the classroom. And the way in which we do assessment has to shift if we're taking students out of the classroom and all their senses are invoked. Right, which doesn't really happen in a classroom. And so what we do in preparation, so I started asking a lot of questions about teaching and learning and different theories that inform how we teach and how we learn. And being, again, surfacing assumptions about learning processes, um, how many learning processes do we engage in in a day, and being explicit about that in the classroom. Did everybody notice that we engage in three learning processes when we did that think, pair, share? At least three, there are probably more. And so again, it's getting those assumptions out there. I want students to be participants in the learning process. I don't want them to just, I want it to be transparent. It's ethical. And then the last piece, which is often neglected, all of these bubbles have research in them. There's research traditions. There's a lot of research on the value of certain approaches to teaching and learning, institutional change, knowledge generation and application, and then partnerships. That's the most neglected bubble. Uh, there isn't a lot of research on how universities impact communities. There's a lot of research on how students learn when they do community-based work. There's a lot of research in that area. So the most neglected area is this area. And so then I started thinking that original question, wow, are faculty trained to do this? Not even close. 
every single set of assumptions in those bubbles. Whenever I do faculty workshops, very rarely do people, if I ask a group of faculty, what theory do you use when you teach? What learning theory? What set of learning theories? Unless they've been, in, even in, in education, <laughs> You know, I was in a college of education. I taught a course in learning theory. Um, very rarely do we actually invoke learning theories when we're teaching. And so, you know, that's a pretty big issue for me. So part of it was just, you know, really thinking, are we even training people to do quality community-based work and what would it entail? So this is an aspirational framework. It's, it's, you know, how would we think about shifting? The other thing I do with faculty, so it's like students. If I'm doing an institute with faculty or staff, and I say, how many of you took your job to change the institution that you're in? And again, very few people raise their hand, but well, we're asking students to be change agents. So are you a change agent within your institution? And what would that look like? Were you trained to be an organizer? You know, how, how would you shift the set of norms that are maybe oppressive? That whole tenure process, what a ridiculously oppressive um, set of rituals. <laughs> <laughs> Let's change that, baby. There's, but, not, there's not enough rabble rousers in tech. And then when you get tenure, how many faculty challenge the system once they get tenure? I was called a rabble rouser about six weeks into my very first job as a 22-year-old. And that's why I'm in academics, because I just asked too many questions. And there, there just isn't enough. Like you said, community partnerships are we taught how to do that. We're not even taught how to teach. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So how many people? Let's go back to the very fundamental starting point. Yep. We're not taught how to teach. Kids ask me, how do I learn? I'm like, <laughs> no idea, man. You know how I learned. I don't know. I can't tell you how. You, so I, I wanted to go back to sort of the beginning and really try to understand because I was being challenged. My own frame of reference, you know, was being challenged, and I was trying to think what goes into quality, community-engaged work. Well, let's step back a little bit and say, well, we're part of an institution that's supposed to be about this, and yet we're not really giving robust training. So a lot of the work that we do in our institutes is to ask a lot of questions, to surface assumptions. And again, not indoctrinate. Um, that's really important. It's all about having people correctly evaluate their assumptions. So if you have assumptions about how translational research, for example, works, or you know, there's a certain set of traditions underpinning that, then let's talk about that. Is it perfect? Probably not. And so I haven't met anybody that doesn't have a set of flawed assumptions. We all have it, it's just part of being human. We have distorted assumptions. Yes? Well, and I think the other issue is, is like, um, I know especially like at the university that I work from, and I'm assuming this is a safe space. Um, <laughs> I think what's all safe space, <laughs> circle of trust. Um, I think the other issue is, is, is um, because it isn't in tenure, um, the people, they're like, well, people are told, well, wait until you reach tenure before you do this. But then, okay, they've already been in then academics for 20 to 25 years, and then you want to start teaching them how to work with the community, and then it's like the whole old dog, new tricks thing. So that's where it's really frustrating. And then as staff who has experience working in the community and doing this, your credentials may not match theirs, so then it's like, what's the validity of you right. teaching me Some how to do that? Dynamics. Yeah, so I think there's like, there's lots of different things that are working, but like the idea of telling people, well, wait till you get your full professor and then you can start doing community-engaged work. It's like so backwards to me. So it's like... And that begs the question again about yeah. sort of institutional approaches. Um, I wanted to make sure, I just wanted to put this up, this is a big thing to unpack. But the yes. whole tenure thing is, is social reproduction, right? I mean, at the end of the day, yep. you get tenure, and now you're going to hold everybody Reprise. else to the same five <laughs> your standard, right? Yeah. It is really so interesting. It is. It's, it's, it's like hazy. My, it my, my, my chair always <laughs> yeah. like yeah. yeah. like yeah. says, like you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, my chair is not even a chair. No rabbit rouser. She said, you know, you don't have tenure, you're right? And I said, you know, <laughs> no, right. right? I mean, because I'm like, I, I'm marketable. I work yeah. in the private sector. I would say I can make more if I leave, you know. Yeah. That's my response. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So uh, this is meant to be provocative, and so uh, it's a whole different um, set of questions, but I wanted to put it out there because I want you to know where my frame of reference is ultimately, because I'm narrowing it down to a lot narrower thing for this presentation. We don't have a lot of so I'm gonna do, the setup is kind of funky for this, but if you could just grab a piece of paper really quickly. Yeah, it could be white because it's snow. I have extra if anybody needs it. And I have a bunch here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah I have a bunch of people need them. One piece of paper. Pass them along. And when you think about community-based work, what keeps you up at night? Write it down on that piece of paper. Oh yeah, I'll just lay it What could go wrong? 
Write it down oh, in that piece of paper. paper. This could be a cathartic experience. I think Andrew might need one. Oh, I need one. Yeah, when you think about doing community based work, what keeps you up? What concerns you? Research man. What could go wrong? No, I don't know. I've never seen this. We talked about it I don't think it has to be a full one. Yeah. You can tear them in half. And then just crumple it up. After you write it, crumple up the piece of paper. So you want one back? This is going to be hard to do. <laughs> Might have to go outside. Because we're going to throw them. We have It'll to pick up someone else's. Is it okay if we go outside? Or like right sure, here? Yeah. Outside this room, because then it's hard to get in here. I Unless we move the table. table. Yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. Well, actually, if you throw it hard enough at the person across from you, that'll be interesting. Okay, I'll leave this one just in case. No, I think, well, yeah, just in case. What question are we answering? Okay. What keeps you up at night? When you think about university community partnerships, what keeps you up at night or what could go wrong? And it's just one sentence. Oh, I was dying. Because, you know, we know that university community partnerships, it's all good, right? Do gooders, well, do gooders, good citizens. Then crumple it. And then when we're all ready, after you crumple, we're going to throw it at somebody, and then you just pick one up that's not yours, hopefully. We're gonna read it out loud. So only one thing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be good, just, just for one, because we'll have a whole mess, and we'll have similar ones, I'm sure. This is a fun exercise also with students. It makes things intentional and explicit. Gets it out there, and it's anonymous. I feel like you should see it. Yeah, don't, don't, you know, be careful. If you're a pitcher or something, <laughs> take it easy. Are you ready? Throw it somewhere not where you are. Like trying to throw it across? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Snowball oh. exercise. <laughs> All right, then pick up I'll get one I'll get that isn't yours. Who needs it? Thank you. Here we go. Okay. Here, give me one. Everybody got one? You have two? If you have your. All right, has everybody got one? Yeah. All right, cool. So, I want you to open it up, and then just a couple people, we don't have to do everybody, but uh, maybe start over here, read, read some. What does it say? Being called a sellout by, quote unquote, my community. Oh, yeah. Being called a sellout? Sellout. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. okay. Indulgent privilege, African, the white supremacy. White supremacy. Okay. Oh, poor communication when it was bad. Poor communication. Am I even making a difference? Good question. Or good. Yeah. How about over here, someone? Uh, but the community members will have a bad experience and trust will crumble. <laughs> Inauthentic support from administration. Oh, come on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did that come up? <laughs> yeah, figure it out. Uh, what else? Okay. We won't meet our partners' expectations. Your group is not statistically significant. I have a colleague at Georgia. We had a, our qualitative program was there. I taught qualitative research. And I go into a lot of these criteria questions as most stats people are never asked where criteria come from. They take, they take a lot of stats courses. Um, and, uh, or they maybe haven't read anything by Donald Campbell. Uh, anyway, um, which I highly recommend. Uh, but anyway, this uh, faculty member, she's retired now, Sharon Merriam, has written extensively in qualitative research, got a couple books out there. She's also the Bible and adult learning theory. Um, if you're interested, three editions of that, a massive book in learning theory. Uh, she wrote an article called N of One, The mm -hmm. Value of N of One. It's a really interesting article. Uh, so, who else? Students, other faculty, myself, others in the institution will engage in oppressive behaviors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Faculty insulting community. Yeah. How about you? Faculty you? insulting oh, community. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Students cause more harm to the community. Mm -hmm. I'm having trouble reading mine. It might be my glasses. That says funding resources, mm -hmm. and what does that say? Endowing. Endowing with enough resources to marginalize youth in the community. I have being seen as experts with solutions to intractical social messes that we actually can't solve. Anybody want to add anything else? Those haven't been said. 
this one says that I won't get everything done for my community partner that I overcommitted and won't have time. Mm. Yes. So this work is pretty easy, I think. Uh, we don't have a lot to think about when we think about university community partnerships. Well, when uh, my colleagues and I and the summits that we run in the institutes and the book and so on, this community of practice that we've been forming, this is what concerns us at night. And that's why we wrote the book. Because there's, uh, there's actually uh, billions of dollars industry of volunteerism. And uh, there are people that are doing lots of harm and they're not necessarily ethical. Uh, and so there's orphanage tourism, there's trafficking, all sorts of really bad things are out there that are happening in this community engaged industry. And so part of this is a response to that. Um, and there are you know, people on our own campuses that just are not well trained even as we talked about teaching and learning. So imagine going outside the classroom. The classroom, I always refer to the classroom to any student as kindergarten. I'm serious. If you've done any community-based work, teaching a class with the weeks that are set, the readings are set, you control the entire process. There's nothing, I mean, unless the fire alarm goes off, there is no unexpected, unpredictable thing. And even the questions students ask, you can just say, yeah, we'll talk about that next week. <laughs> we're not gonna cover that right now. I'll get back to you on that one. It's completely under your control. I mean, it's like, and yet we, we don't even have theories for doing that, you know, and, and practices and so on. We're not necessarily trained in that. And then we'll go out in the community where everything is ill-structured and messy and problematic and anything can happen. Even just a student getting sick um, you know, so uh, it's amazing to me that we actually do this work. Um, and so that's why a lot of the genesis of all the work that we've been doing for the past 20 years of creating this community of practice is to try to do this work well and not, there are people that critique it and say we shouldn't do it at all. And so our approach is, no, I think we can do it, which just has to be higher quality. That we can do this well. We think we can do it well and we think it makes a difference. So that's part of it. We, what we're, we always keep that in the back of our minds. Um, so. Um, when you think about community university partnerships, one of the first things we do is we ask people if they have a set of principles that guide their practice, that are explicit and intentional. Because a lot of uh, the, the origins of the service learning field, uh, there were a number of conferences early on to think about are there some guiding principles that we should create? Most fields have standards of practice. Planning has, for example, ethical principles that you have to abide by, particularly if you're working with people and you're building bridges, you wanna make sure you have some, not just technical skills, a set of ethical principles you would hope um, and some professions do have that and some are sort of out there and we're to be negotiated and some are absent so if you had to think about that just write down a few right now just on a piece of paper it could be the one that was crumpled up what would you think would be absolutely necessary when you're thinking about quality university community partnerships a principle that you would that would guide you as many as you can think of but in you know at least one Okay, uh, just let's share just a couple of there out there. I'm sure we've written down some, hopefully some similar ones, but actually it could be all different. Uh, maybe somebody who hasn't said anything, although it sounds like most people have, but maybe, I think everybody has, but just share a principle, someone, popcorn-like. We're popping with principles. <laughs> Have purity and humility and values. Nice. I said listen and be humble. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, trust and reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Authentic partnerships without tokenism. Some other ones, yes. Uh, in introducing belly and community partner values and norms. Okay. What else? Our esteemed doctoral students. Uh, <laughs> openness. Openness. Uh, mutual benefit. Mutual benefit, okay. Mutuality, that's a big principle in the field. Reciprocity is a big principle. It was part of the sort of original principles. Wing, we call them the wing spread principles, if you Google that. 
That's wing spread was sort of some of the original principles. Yeah. Sorry to double, uh, but in the list, you, you were talking about the, the industry of harm that's built around volunteerism. And it made me think of the idea of the kind of critical diligence that it has to go beyond a kind of uh, whatever. A do no harm mentality mm -hmm. is fine, or even a beneficence mentality is fine, mm -hmm. but there's an element of critical thinking that's required in there to uncover the unintended consequences of your own actions. I yeah. don't know how to summarize that into a thing. <laughs> I think we what we would put in here is uh, opportunities for critical reflection. Mm -hmm. That there should be, you know, um, built into any program critical reflection. It should be the experiences should be guided by that all the time. Mm -hmm. What are our assumptions right now? The assumptions of others around us. Um, how are we critically evaluating what we're doing? The actions that we're taking um, and uh, the ethical dilemmas that we may be in. Yeah. Transparency. Transparency. What else? Uh, yes. Um, I just I got a little paragraph, but basically, community is the expert. Community is the expert. That's shifting. Yes. Appreciating shared and unique experiences. Okay. Think of the short run and the long run. Think of the short run and the long run. That's really interesting. I I built that in, in our my syllabi when I do this work. Um, you know, again, it's the assumption, particularly for students, that they're solving a problem that's been persistent for hundreds of years, <laughs> persistent poverty, and to think, you know, there may be some short-term outcomes before we get to that alleviation of poverty. Um, so, that, so that's really important. It helps it liberate somebody from feeling helpless, also, to kind of put that out there in the syllabus in an intentional, transparent way. We're not here to solve, you know, Nicaragua is still pretty much in the nation-state system, where it is, it's not going to climb too fast, especially nowadays, um, the current situation there. Um, anything else that people wanted to share, principle-wise? Quick question on this. So if we were going to do this work, would it be important to make sure that we have a set of principles that guide our work before we go out into community? And be, do you think that is a good thing to be intentional about that? Intentional. Yeah, and, and would that conversation happen with uh, just students, or would that include all the participants? In the community. <laughs> yeah, how many people, be honest, how many people do that in their community-based work? Negotiate Try. principles, and intentionally and out loud and explicitly. Try. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, there are, yeah. In our West Side Promise, yeah, so our, the West Side Promise consists of the organizations that are of the West Side. Okay. So kind of our guiding thing is we're working side by side to solve the problems of that community but we're working side by side it's not us telling them mm -hmm. it's us helping them to solve their problem it's not ours and that we're not the experts they are oh, okay so that's really important and that does sound like it's pretty explicit yes okay so that's just something to think about uh, when you're we're doing this work is to one, have a set of principles yourself. If you have an important role in that process, but, but navigate that to have that conversation about the principles that guide our. I do a lot of, uh, I call it a ground tool exercise. It's in the, I think it's in the book. Um, I don't know if they call it ground tool. I like ground tool because it cultivates a set of values and principles. And I do it in an anonymous way. And one way to do it is you just say, think about a bad experience that you've had in any kind of learning environment. And then let's try to avoid that. And think about a really good experience and let's try to embrace that or affirm that and that can become some tools and again it's just putting our assumptions about the quality of the teaching and learning environment but collectively owning that it's also kind of a popular education approach to negotiate democratically with students I love that process because they're like really you're not going to tell me in the syllabus what the standards are and how we can't cheat and all that kind of stuff um, so I was like no I believe you I don't think you're gonna Maybe one of you here, but um, this was uh, at the University of Georgia based on some projects we were uh, doing um, and programs we had in uh, the local community. And um, the one thing I just wanted to point out in planning programs is there's a bunch of R's there. Um, and we were thinking about, you know, when we're navigating with community partners, it's all about relationships. So if there's one message takeaway from this is uh, relational trust for me is my probably uh, the core guiding principle of this work. At the end of the day, if I can say that I've built quality relationships, doesn't matter what resources are at the table, mm -hmm. 
it doesn't matter what disparities are there, but if I have a quality relationship that's based on trust, um, and I've really taken the time to build that, um, then, uh, then I feel like I'm um, honoring the community-based um, program and the partnerships that I have. So, um, and that I think, lots of skills and knowledge and experience and so on and practices go into that. I think someone mentioned authenticity and being authentic. Do you think the cultural history of the U.S. or America or the world in general is conducive to build trust? That's a great question. So how many people here uh, who are American, well, here's an interesting thing. When I do the identity pie and we're going to go to some country, how many people do you think put American in their identity pie? Zip. No one has ever done that. I always point it out because then I'll, you can do lots of things with the identity pie, but often what I'll do is I'll, I'll also ask them to do an identity pie toward the country that they're with, which means they have to enter into an historical relationship. So you really need to understand the context that you're going to. And if you don't, then we're not guided by a principle that I think is really important, which would be know the community, they're the experts, understand and how far back do you go is an important question as well, to understand the historical development of whatever issue we're looking at and who's involved and who are the stakeholders. But that's a really important question, but that American question in particular is very important. And then I'll say, what do you think people are gonna, how are people gonna understand your identity? And then everyone says, oh, they're gonna think of us as Americans. And then I say, what does that mean? And again, it's about, that's just the constructivist part. It's not, we aren't getting the power of relations yet, because I don't assume that they know our relationship with every single country that we've had some sphere of influence in, right? But that's a really, being in international relations, that's something that was, you know, drilled into us. Um, and having worked with many different countries, that's something that I confronted many times and started using dissonance and ir irony to get out of some of those situations. Um, so uh, when I lived in Spain, I saw a Yankee go home everywhere in Casey Valle. And, uh, and so, and they use a term just like, you know, you hear gringo uh, in other countries. Um, they, used, they say Yankee cabrón, which isn't a pleasant if you know Spanish, anybody knows Spanish here. <laughs> so I would introduce myself as Yankee cabrón. And it just shifted the relationship immediately. So just the use of irony, you know, or there are certain terms that are used that, that invoke <coughs> the historical relationship. So in Spain, I'll just use Spain, I know the time. Uh, the, a lot of people from like someone in a restaurant to a bartender to a door person to people I worked with at the University of uh, Madrid, um, they'd always say leche polvo. Do you know what that means in Spanish? Milk. Powdered milk. Everyone, what, the, what is it with powdered milk, leche polvo? And it turns out that's how they experienced, according to Spaniards and their perspective, their worldview and their historical relationship with Americans, that's how they experienced the Marshall Plan. Oh. All we got was powdered milk. Well, whether it's true or not doesn't matter, right? It's just a set of assumptions, and you can literally investigate that historical relationship. If we go to Nicaragua, to your point, Terri Ann, if we go to the Pacific Coast, we have a very different relationship with the Pacific Coast than if we go to the Atlantic Coast. Two very different colonizing histories, right? And so it's fascinating for students to unpack those histories, literally in two different regions of the same country. Uh, and so we get at that notion of positionality, which is so important, even more than just being American. Everybody has some positionality, and it shifts depending on the context that you're in. But we have this historical relationship. Literally, it's linguistic. And so often I'll have students, and it could be in the United States. It could be in neighborhoods in the United States. Um, it could be what it means to be an Ithacan. Um, so it's really interesting to talk about, like, what are some linguistic, are you paying attention? And so when I talked about the skill set you have in a classroom and outside the classroom, well, if we're, are we training our students to be astute observers, right? To be really critical ethnographers. Not really, unless they're in anthropology. But yet we're taking them out in the community. Are we really training them in that way? Are they, ta so I'll, just, I'll mention one other thing. I was teaching a community development course when I first came back to urban planning at Cornell. And uh, at that time it was Hurricane Katrina and it was devastating. A lot of people couldn't walk away from the television if you weren't in New Orleans and you were just completely, uh, utterly just distressed, sad. I remember sitting in Georgia thinking, oh my God, I heard about these two students that hijacked a bus, went through all the different blockades and took people out. And I remember thinking, gosh, I just, I, as a faculty member, 
I need to do something about this. It wasn't even enough to work in immigrant communities in Georgia. I was just seeing the devastation there. Fast forward, I'm in Cornell. We end up getting a contract with New Orleans and we became a planning firm, my class, to write the recovery plan for the Ninth Ward, the, the official recovery plan. And so uh, if you're familiar with planning, we did all sorts of vis visioning and charrettes. There had been two previous plans, and guess what those two previous plans said? Ray Nagin's commission in the Urban Land Institute raised the Ninth Ward. It's been flooded. You can't recapture the Ninth Ward. Who cares if there's been a generation of homeowners there? So we felt we had a moral obligation as a planning department, one of two in the country, we're the only not-for-profit firm, the rest could pay for firms, the rest of the neighborhoods. And we worked with the Ninth Ward, we interviewed over 200 residents, and I was handling that part for the first time. Nobody even thought residents were there building their homes mm -hmm. without any resources. It was amazing. So we sent a group of students down there, and I had a very limited amount of time. We had a semester to do a post-disaster recovery plan. If you think of Kobe and other places, it takes two years at least to do a recovery plan. There's billions of dollars waiting, and the two previous plans that were highly regarded and rigorous said raise the ninth ward, and they were literally raising neighborhoods at that, while we were doing this. So we felt like this urgency. We had one semester to provide four deliverables in order to get it accepted through the legislature so that federal funding can come flow back. And our hope was we had to do our research better than any private firm. We were working with undergrads and new graduate students, master's students, and we rewrote the syllabus. Uh, it was a standard kind of community development workshop. Um, that I was gonna teach in Ithaca. But we had this contract, so we did our work, we got fired, we partnered with ACORN, they got fired, so we got fired. So we ended up doing it all outside the official planning process through some propaganda and organizing. My chair of that department was an organizer before he was an academic. We actually got the plan accepted and went through the legislature, which we did some interesting things to make that happen. And we inter interviewed over 200 residents and we looked at 3,000 parcels, physical and structural damage, and we created our own criteria for doing that. We found that 75% of the ninth ward could be rebuilt. And a couple weeks after our plan was accepted, Nagin came out with the head of the planning board in New Orleans saying that $130 million was gonna be devoted to the ninth ward to rebuild it. But so, you know, when people say what success, it really, what happens with that money is a whole different story when someone publicly says that. But here's the thing I wanted to mention. When I did that workshop, I said to students, all I want you to do, I have to write the chapter on the residents' perspectives in this plan I need you to pay attention to what you're hearing. Get some quotations for me. How many quotations do you think they got when they came back? They had surveys, none. So again, it's just the training we get to be astute observers, to be good listeners, right? To, to develop authentic relationships, to understand our positionality, even non-verbally, is so hard to do. The skill set and knowledge around that is so, important if we're gonna, again, the, and the implications, think about that do no harm. That's a principle for me. And so we're, we're responsible as, so we were very, very, very uh, worried that our students wouldn't come through, and in the end they did. They collected a lot of data. They had to collect all the, pre, they had to do an analysis of all previous plans, transportation, pipes and drains, education, you name it. In a place that was, had experienced a disaster, it was no longer what was envisioned. And so reconstructing a vision was part of what we were doing. Um, and that was right before the recession too, because we created a course to finance our plan. Uh, and went down and talked to Freddie Mae and Fannie, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and mm. all the places they went up exploded uh, after the recession. So that failed. Uh, and we wrote a book about it, if you're interested. And it's got community perspectives and student perspectives, and it's raw. It was not an easy experience, and it was very and very problematic. In fact, I couldn't write a chapter. I wrote one because the guy, one of the authors, cajoled me into writing something, and he published it. But I was so disturbed because no one at the university supported us. What was the book? Uh, Transformative Education Post Katrina. So Ken Reardon and John Forster. If you know their work in planning. Um, Did you? The, so you, the keeps you up at night question the, as a planner the, and the, you know from that perspective. Stuff sits on a shelf, and so I'm, I'm oh, so what's so fascinating about that? So Ken, who was uh, Ken, was born and I think he was born an organizer, a propagandist. His role in the course, he told me, was propagandist, mm -hmm. and so, it worked. So people do propaganda differently, and I'm I'm just looking at propaganda post the age of social media. Like you're in a department 
that's very conservative and you're you're interested in your tenure you probably can't outwardly do propaganda so when you said you know <laughs> you wanted your students to listen um, and bring you back quotes I wondered if there was a different way for you to ask them to do that uh, maybe to do it anonymously mm -hmm. or to write because Sometimes people hear things or they know things, but they don't want to admit that they're the ones who know it because they're protecting themselves. I think part of it was just they hadn't been trained oh. and they really didn't have the technical skills. They did door-to-door -door surveys. They collected over 200 surveys and they talked to people and they describe it in their chapters, how powerful and emotional the experience was to go. People would invite them in their houses. Mm -hmm. So part of it, I think, was actually the emotional experience when you're in a post-disaster setting. It mm -hmm. messes with your whole brain. And in Nicaragua, we were there after Hurricane Mitch and and went to communities that were buried in mudslides. So um, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very powerful, we knew that was gonna happen, uh, but we also had to do diligence. So it, it begs the question about the preparation of students and whether or not they actually can handle that kind of a setting. But it's a good question you ask. I mean, I try, I knew, we knew that, we anticipated it. Mm -hmm. Canada, both of us were weathered community-based um, uh, faculty. So we had done a lot of different programs. Ken's previous experience was in East St. Louis. And if anybody's heard of the East St. Louis Action Research Project, that was what he was involved in for many, many years in a place that was bankrupt and as a young professor. But he, he mastered this idea of, of propaganda in the sense of he wanted to control the media. He wanted to control how the university understood the process. We had to go outside the planning board to make sure it was resident led. And then we had to actually, um, we knew the plans were all coming out and we actually presented ours a week beforehand in the Holy Angels um, facility in New Orleans, invited everybody there, and we came out in 450 newspapers. So they couldn't, they could not pay attention to our plan. And he's done all sorts of things, because he used to do all sorts of street theater, and he's just very, um, cracks me up, because he's just, he's got a photographic memory, so he understands the history of that whole region and more than anyone I know. Uh, but what was interesting about that was, we knew that meant psychologically it was gonna be very difficult uh, you know, in racial terms and economic terms and in many different ways for students and there were lots of different mutinies throughout the process. Uh, reflection was not a part of it. It was too hard. It was too quick. Mm -hmm. Six months was really hard to step back and reflect even though I kept trying and trying in different ways and they just wanted to do, not reflect. Uh, and part of it was we had to. But uh, the point I wanted to raise though is, is you know, just the, the preparation piece is so important in order to not create harm. I'm always questioning that, stepping back and wondering, can students actually do this? Um, so, uh, and can they build that relationship? Can they do the relationship building? Um, so a couple things on that. Uh, the first essay I ever wrote was, what does it mean to create a quality partnership? And it was based on my experience in Nicaragua. And I had no idea what I was really doing in 94 when I went down to the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, even though I'd studied the regions for my international relations degree. But I really didn't understand the Atlantic coast. I didn't speak Mosquito. Um, and, uh, and there's not a lot was written by indigenous folks down there, although the more and more I went down there, the more and more I tried to collect local knowledge. And then I ended up giving up all my classes and local people taught those classes. And uh, I think what I regret is I wish we had compensated them better. Um, but again, it's a community college, so we had to figure out a way, what's our institutional, what network do we want to build ourselves around? So we actually decided not to build ourselves around our community college. We didn't think they could resource the effort. So we got involved with a huge community practice of medical practitioners in Maine that we heard about that were going down there every week and month and had founded the hospital and supported it and resourced it. So commitment. When I went down, there was a guy, Dr. Umberto from the Atlantic Coast. He was from the Mosquito Coast, uh, near the Rio Coco. And he just shook his head our first year. And I remember saying to him, what's, what's up? Like he just, he didn't seem psyched to work with us. He said, you won't be back. And it was the first year, he's like, it's not gonna happen. You know, so when you think about what Americans, how people view Americans, mm -hmm. he's like, this is just a one-shot deal. And that really bothered me um, because I did go into it with good intentions. I think at the time, we also went into it, we built our courses around the site visits that we did and the conversations with community members. So we created new courses as opposed to fit existing curriculum. Um, and then, so we had a commitment. And you know, there are, think about it, there aren't too many marriages that last 25 years. And I don't even know if that's a good thing because um, we've built a massive network over 25 years all over the world that's focused on 
mental health and a variety of other issues that, uh, that are experienced not just in the Atlantic coast but in other places. Um, but 25 years is a long time. I don't know a lot of faculty that have had a 25 year partnership with a community. Just staying in one place. Uh, and then I actually don't like faculty driven models, by the way. I actually think third party providers do a better job of sustaining programs. Um, this idea of collaborating. So you talk a lot about local knowledge and connection. And that was a big thing for us. Just constantly just meeting people and talking to them, really resting our, someone said openness. So not having any assumptions about, you know, what people know and how they experience a particular problem, uh, but just asking a lot of questions, engaging in dialogue. Um, we were using some Freirean methods. People would say, will you dialogue with us there in Spanish? It was really <laughs> interesting that they were familiar with Freire also in Nicaragua. Yeah. And part of that had to do with, we were there right after the Civil War. So Sandinistas obviously incorporated a lot of the Freirean methodology. So it was just interesting to us. And the Atlantic coast is just a fascinating place. Um, and so uh, we kind of, I, you know, they stepped back and I was like, what was it, you know, that we're, we're into the program about 12 years and I'm like, what is it that constitutes this partnership? Like, why is it continued? And I think it was partly, these were aspirational goals for us to make a commitment before going in. Like to say to Dr. Umberto, we're back, we're here. And actually Donna's gonna do her sabbatical here and she's gonna stay here in this crazy place mm -hmm. that nobody would wanna stay in because it doesn't have any running water and it's, who knows how else, you know, all the things that happen when you're down there. The environment's complicated, um, and so the conditions are difficult. So um, anyway, those are three. And then this, uh, when I started studying a little bit about community development, so when I was down in Nicaragua, someone asked me, it was a C, he was a, the um, executive director of an NGO that was down there. And uh, before, we were in a circle, and he was in front of us, and he said, okay, before I begin, I just wanna know what your theory of development is. Okay, that was a moment for me. I guess I'm not very well trained in development because I'm a political scientist and I don't have a theory of development. So the question really behind that was, why are you here? If you don't have a theory of development, if you don't understand your approach to community development and that you're actually engaging in that kind of work. And so I went back to Cornell when I was doing my doctorate. I took as many courses as I could. There's a lot in Cal's. D, uh, rural soci well, it was rural sociology when yeah. we were there, now it's DSOC. Is Victor Neese still there? No, no. Yeah. Uh, Phil McMichael, lots of other people. So a lot of the work, though, wasn't necessarily incredibly resource-limited post-Civil War communities. So that was also the context was very difficult. I was really challenged with how to think about working within this community. Um, the idea of relational trust and then reciprocity and mutuality came up in our principles, right? Those are that, so this asset-based approach is really important. Have people heard of the asset-based approach to community development, ABCD, mm -hmm. Krexman and McKnight's work, mm -hmm. Northwestern University, mm -hmm. everyone, I see everybody nodding their head. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of resources, by the way, also over there that if you just Google ABCD, asset-based community development. And it's this idea of getting out of the deficit model, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing local knowledge, seeing all the assets that people bring to the table. So that was something that we had not studied. Um, and so we, I think we kind of had an inclination toward being open to people. I think because both of us had lived in a lot of countries and had navigated that and experienced discrimination and, and difficulty and adjustment and so on. So I think we were kind of wanting to just learn as much as possible before doing anything. So just quickly, um, those are just a couple others. And then someone mentioned transactional. Who was that? Transactional. But it was in relationship with students and universities. Yes. So often our relationships in general as consumers are transactional. And so a lot of times our university community partnerships are. And so if you think about that, transactional relations are instrumental and often designed to complete short-term tasks for them all to come together on the basis of exchange, each offering something the other desires, both benefit from the exchange and no long-term change is expected. Transformational, however, what would constitute, and that was that framework I was talking about, how do we change the institution? How do we change how we teach and learn? How do we change how we think about knowledge? How do we change how we think about working with communities? This transformational relationship where both persons grow and change because of the deeper, more sustainable commitments. In a transformational relationship, persons come together in a more open-ended process of indefinite, but longer term duration and bring a receptiveness, if not an over, -intent, over an intention to explore emergent possibilities, revisit and revise their own goals and identities and develop systems they work with and beyond the status quo. So uh, transformation is really hard. Transformational work 
How comfortable is it to question the status quo, particularly when there's always power, whenever there's more than one person in the room? So uh, I know we've already hit our time, but I just want to make sure that you understand that this, um, that I think this uh, resource is really important. There's a way of thinking about how community university partners are moved toward transformational. And this group of people, Bringo and Clayton, they're all at um, IUPUI Indianapolis, Indianapolis University and Purdue University in Indianapolis. It's actually called IUPUI. <laughs> IUPUI. Um, they've done a lot of work and ways in which you assess transactional and transformational. So um, I highly recommend their work. Um, and then last but not least, and this is a really cool article, by the way, David Corton, Community Development. So when I was challenged with that notion of community development, I love this particular, it's, it's built off of more international NGO work, but it's applicable to any community development situation. And I'll ask my students to reflect on the current partnership that we have and where it fits within these generations, what Corton calls generations of development. And it was, he, was, he wrote a book on um, uh, getting to the 21st century around the history of, of development and, and uh, different approaches that have been used. And in his, this chapter is called From Relief to People's Movements. What I love about this, it has two, the thesis, two things. Have a theory of development and know that it has strengths and limitations in any context, mm -hmm. right? And so if you ask somebody, what's your theory of development? It's not only like they can rattle that off their tongue or they have a lot of effect examples. What I love about this is it has a nice set of criteria. What's the problem definition? So if people are in a refugee crisis, they need food, they need shelter, and so on just like post-Katrina, right? Recovery, but rebuild. So we definitely had to do all sorts of, um, take out mold and clean houses and do all sorts of things like that. But then it was like, what's the recovery and rebuilding plan? So um, it gets to sort of, a lot of people like to do community-based work, sort of a second development, second generation strategy. But a lot of students, if you ask them, and I'm sure you work with this policy, policy impacts people, so many more people, right? But often students aren't, they're not necessarily taking that approach. They often it's one-to-one -one or direct service um, but how do we think about policy? Um, we always joke about on the Mosquito Coast, people there know how to build boats out of trees. And you know the whole thing about give somebody a fish, feeds them for a day, teach them to fish, feeds them for a lifetime. I had a student after, I did a longitudinal study over eight years, and I interviewed a bunch of students over this period that went on this program. And I asked this one student, she was in Honduras, and she was there during Hurricane Mitch as well, as a Peace Corps volunteer. She said that whole thing about, she's like, I got kids coming to my house, I give them fish. I give them as much fish as they want. <laughs> She's like, I'm also doing teaching. And she's like, you know, but like in Nicaragua, they can build boats. We don't need to teach them how to fish or they can build boats out of trees. And she's like, they just don't have access to the water, right? <laughs> Somebody else owns their water. It's like Aventus' question when he talked about power and powerlessness when he did work at Highlander. People didn't know who owned their land. So, you know, that was a question for him. He's like, wow, when he was a doctoral student. So he wrote this chapter called Power and Powerlessness. So his whole theory of power is really well known, but it was based on a question of, we don't know who owns our land. And so it's imagine you can build a boat from a tree and you don't have access to the water right in front of your um, house well, in that case. So anyway, so the policy dimension, and then there's this idea of, sometimes I'll ask students, are you part of any kind of movement? You know, it's always an interesting question, or just anyone, just ask them, do you feel part of a movement? And just to kind of un un unpack that a little bit, um, see yourself part of something larger um, and think about all this the movements that have happened over history it takes a lot of people and it tends to be voluntary at least that's Corden's argument you throw money at it people have a different incentive mm -hmm. it's intrinsic so it's, it's an interesting question about voluntary action why people what incents people to get involved when we're working with communities what's that stake or that interest is it extrinsic, intrinsic? And often when you're in the communities, what's the first thing they say? We don't have the resources. That's almost always the first thing. And that, that worries me because it's like, ah, there's not that intrinsic. I'm here for the, for the end. Okay, so just to finish up, um, I'm gonna pass this out. We don't have time to engage in it, but it's, it's, we basically created this approach called fair trade learning. And I'm gonna hand this out. And it's just sort of a worksheet and it's a set of principles. What if we shifted the way we think about learning and it, it inclu includes student, community, uh, stakeholders, and to having a set of principles. Um, and I highly recommend checking it out. We built this not, we didn't build it, we actually vetted it for about three or four years all over the world, the Global South, Global North, 
because we were just, again, trying to model our principles and getting as many voices to build a set of principles that we can assess partnerships on. And so a lot of it has to do with equity, a lot of it has to do how are we um, evaluating economic development. And I should mention that the fair trade learning principles came from the board of a not-for-profit who weren't satisfied with their work in Jamaica, actually. Uh, and there was a guy there, uh, Mr. Brown, who they worked with for a long time in Petersburg. And uh, he said, uh, your students can pad their resumes with the work they're doing down here. What are we supposed to say? We hung out with a bunch of white students? And so we also want to have skills and knowledge and, and think about compensation. So I know we're at our time, so, um, but I, I'd love it if you, um, I'll pass them all on. But um, some of the principles in here, um, so, you know, dual purposes, community voice and direction, commitment and sustainability, transparency, I think Terry Ann mentioned that, environmental sustainability, and footprint redu uh, reduction, economic sustainability, deliberate diversity, intercultural contact and reflection, and global community building. And then we sort of have a rubric for different sets of principles after these core principles. And so it's a way to talk to your community partner about how well are we doing, where are we now, and where do we want to go? What's sort of the current situation around these principles? And it's a way of having a conversation. Um, do we have any of the extra? Oh, so if, you know, for example, um, you know, student preparation, you know, if you think about the student experience, uh, program length. Thanks for coming. Very nice. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, I'm sure. I have a feeling you have many follow-up questions. It's great, thank you. Um, so, and then, uh, so you just see on the side here, you know, what, what does it look like and then actions to be taken. But it's a way of just thinking about some of these principles. Um, and uh, there's a, also community-centric uh, principles. So thinking about local sourcing, how do we think about our economic relationship with the communities we work with? Um, how would we assess whether or not communities are building equity in some way? So this group, um, Amazage is the name of the not-for-profit. It's Portuguese for um, friendship, amistad, and they started in Brazil. But they do things like they hire only locals to run their programs. Um, they do programs in Pittsburgh. They're based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, so they also work with neighborhoods. They work in Ireland. They work all over the world. Um, and their, uh, Mr. Brown triggered this question of, you know, are we really doing the best we can uh, as a community partnership? And so they work with this um, uh, women's cooperative and uh, they renegotiated the compensation that the women get for hosting students. Um, and, uh, and they also uh, partner, this cooperative, to fund different initiatives, community development initiatives in their community through the compensation they get, a percentage goes toward this community fund. So they're doing really interesting things, especially in Jamaica, but they're trying to model this fair trade learning practice. And uh, it's just, again, another way of thinking about the relationship that you have with a partner, the learning relationship, the economic relationship, uh, not just the personal or the institutional relationship. So um, I hope that's useful. Uh, take, if you have any questions about the fair trade learning principles or unpacking it, usually what we do is we do one exercise and you just choose one principle and we kind of talk about it where you are with that and where you'd like to go. And most of them are things that we could always improve. Um, but I think that's sort of the, the last thing I wanted to talk about, this fair trade learning principles. Um, hopefully this was interesting uh, and you have some questions and if you want to follow up with me, I'd be happy to um, continue the conversation. 